Welcome to Startup Grind. Who has never been to a Startup Grind before? Wow. Thank you guys so much for coming. Who's been to more than one Startup Grind? Awesome. Thank you guys so much. So Startup Grind is run by Google for Entrepreneurs. There are like 200 chapters all over the world. We're really happy to have the Arkansas chapter in Arkansas. Um, so once a month, we have a fireside chat with a local influencer or entrepreneur, typically someone you wouldn't like meet on the street, someone who people want to come hear uh, tell their life story, like Rush. So we're super, super happy to have Rush Harding with us tonight. Um, this is run by The Conductor, which is a partnership with Startup Junkie and UCA. So thank you so much to our sponsors for making this happen. And before we get started, a huge thanks to the Conductor team for making this possible. Um, this is totally a group effort. And thanks for, to Tacos for Life for providing the food. So um, before I get started, we encourage everyone to be social on social media. So share what you're hearing tonight. Quote Rush on Twitter. Do you have a, do you have a Twitter account? Don't do Twitter. Okay. Well, we have, it's at AR underscore conductor, and our hashtag is full steam AR. So we encourage you guys to take pictures and tweet throughout the event. At the end, we have a, a Q&A. So think about what you want to ask, Rush, and then we can go ahead and move into the Q&A after the fireside chat. We're going to go ahead and get started. Can you just tell us about yourself? Um, my name is, I, I'll talk loud enough. If, if, if you can't hear me, let me know. Jack, can okay. you hear for the video? He would prefer the Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, my name is Rush Harding. Um, I'm a lifelong Arkansan. I grew up in a community in East Arkansas in the Delta uh, called Clarendon. Uh, my mom and dad were both school teachers. I graduated uh, from the University of Central Arkansas here. I uh, met my wife as a result of that. Uh, so both of my parents went to UCA. My wife and I did as well, and two of our three children are graduates from UCA. Perfect. Can you talk a little bit more about, and I'll, can you talk a little more about growing up in Clarendon and how that shaped your life? Um, <clears throat> well, the, the Delta is a lot different place today than it was in the, the 50s and 60s when I was growing up. Uh, and Clarendon was a special community then. Uh, and it still is to me now, um, but uh, my mom and dad were, were school teachers, as I'd said. My dad was a legendary coach there that coached several generations of young men and women. Uh, the football field there in Clarendon is named after him today. Uh, he's much revered by the, the citizens of that community, as is uh, my mother and my family's roots uh, still run deep there, and I'm, I'm, I'm still connected uh, to a lot of people. One thing that's neat about that, uh, so I, I grew up in a special way with a lot of special people that cared about me, but my mom and dad being educators were always working on another degree. So my mom was a home ec teacher that eventually became a guidance counselor. My dad was a coach that eventually became a high school administrator. So when I was 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, we lived uh, in Conway in the summer times. When, when I, so I, pl I played Little League Baseball here in Conway and made numerous friends uh, that I you know, reconnected with at UCA as a student that I'm still friends with uh, today. Uh, it, I lived in Minton Hall when it was brand new. That was like 1964 when Minton Hall was built, and, um, uh, and have a lot of good memories of, of, of being in Conway in, uh, in, the, in the summers when I was a young, impressionable uh, pre-teenager, I guess. So can you talk a little bit about your educational pursuits after high school? Um, well, I was, I was governor of Boy State in 1971. I'm sure most of you, that's a, a, a youth model government uh, where uh, organizations in your community uh, nominate young people to go to that. U, UCA hosts uh, Boy State now. Back in the early 70s, Boy State was held at Camp Robinson and, and, and you stayed in the barracks that had uh, kind of a, a, it may have been a little tougher environment than, than what they have now. Uh, I was honored. Last year, uh, I got inducted into the Boy State Hall of Fame here on the campus at UCA, which I, I'm proud of that. Uh, but 
my best friend was a guy named Gary Cook, and we did everything together. And uh, we always were going to go to college together. And then Gary got interested in military academies. Uh, my mother was the guidance counselor by this time. We told my mother, well, we're both going to go to West Point. And my mother would tell us, you boys have to be realistic. Two boys from Clarendon, 48 young people in your senior class aren't going to get an appointment to the same military academy in the same year. You're not being realistic. And, and we told my mom, oh, you don't know us very well. And so we ended up getting that done. And that was more my friend's dream than my dream. But we had always sworn a pack uh, to go to college together. I, I always wanted to go to UCA because it's the college campus I knew from having lived on it and all those summers. And I knew a lot of the coaches instruct and instructors here. Uh, and then my friend, we were co-valedictorians of the senior class. I was uh, you know, president of the student body. He was vice president. He was my campaign manager at Boy State. And then Gary, he drowned in a tragic accident about three days after our high school graduation. And uh, in that small community, people would say, well, you've got to go to West Point and do good for both of you. And, uh, it, it, and it was prestigious to my parents. And so I went ahead and went, uh, finished my first year because I didn't want people to say that, that it, you know, I couldn't hack plebe year or I couldn't do well academically. Came home for, for a 30 day summer break, uh, went back uh, for my, what the year, sophomore year is called yearling year at West Point. And then um, I resigned my commission and came back home. Uh, primarily, I, as I shared with you earlier, I'm, uh, men in my family have been beaten by team woman forever. I'd met a girl from UCA <laughs> whose father was actually president of UCA uh, at the time, Jeff Ferris, his daughter Elizabeth, who's on our board of trustees now and is a great friend and was quite smitten with her and probably used that as a reason to to come home. So it was like the transfer to UCA. Um, that, that if well, ROT they had ROTC on campus. So if you saw a military officer on campus, about because I mean I'm out of West Point on a Friday, and we started classes here at UCL on a Monday, and you'd want to snap to attention and salute if you just saw an ROTC guy on campus. And it was uh, it was um, a quite of difference in culture, but it was refreshing, and I enjoyed it. Um, because you didn't you didn't have much fun as a as a plebe uh, at West Point and and even though it was a special place and it's still the defining experience in my life in terms of of uh, of helping you understand that the only limits you have on yourself are what you choose to have and and helping you understand tenacity and understanding discipline and understanding perseverance. And those things you learn in a very pronounced way uh, in that environment. And, and they have, uh, have helped me in a big way in my professional life and my personal life as a husband and as a father. Um, uh, but uh, UCA was an uh, enjoyable respite from the rigors of that life. So when you were a student at UCA, what did you think you would be able to do? Um, I thought I would always coach and teach because that's what my parents had done. And so I majored, uh, I didn't really like math, but I had so much math that I transferred from the military academy. My advisor uh, suggested that I go ahead and get a major in math and English, which would be two, two disciplines on the opposite end of the spectrum to where if you want to coach and you're certified to teach English and math, well, then you'll have a lot of options as you uh, pursue a teaching career. So that's what I did. And what, why did you not pursue coaching and teaching? Uh, my first, uh, the first job offer I had, so graduated in May of 1976. Uh, my, my dad, of course, was uh, a principal and knew every coach in Arkansas. And um, uh, had a lot of opportunities to coach. The, the first job offer I had was for 8400 a year. And I, I was doing my math 
on trying to budget that 8,400, apartment, car, groceries, utilities, and I just couldn't make that 8,400 work. And of course, my, my dad told me, son, you take your salary over nine months, and then you get you a job working at a gas station or something in the summer, and that's how you make ends meet. Uh, and uh, I, I had uh, met some people uh, in Little Rock uh, that were in the investment banking business, the, the field that I've been in for 41 years. And uh, uh, I, I, I had gotten interested in that. My father, my father didn't want me to do that. Uh, uh, that, uh, that the business had some image issues in the late 70s and late 80s. Little Rock was known uh, for uh, uh, having several firms in the business that weren't considered too reputable. And, uh, but I was very fortunate that the, the firm that I went to work for and the gentleman uh, that became my mentor and later my partner, a gentleman named Adrian Cruz, our firm is still called Cruz & Associates, and Adrian uh, was, uh, uh, was adamant about doing business the right way, about holding the high standards in our industry. And I was real fortunate that, that my first job was working uh, for a gentleman that demanded that our business be done the right way. So when, I think this when you and I were talking, I read this about you, but you were uniting mostly. And that seems like, was that a turning point in your life? I don't know if meeting, meeting Dick was a turning point, but it was a turning point in terms of the professional direction of my life. And so, so Dick, Dick was a unique character. He was probably the most flamboyant um, um, person in sales in our industry in Little Rock at that time, probably the top producer or the top one or two producers in the city. So I was actually with a bunch of my fraternity brothers from UCA uh, we would go to Little Rocks for our, for our we, we would have just a party on Friday night, then we would have our end of the year formal uh, on Saturday night in Little Rock. And so this was at a Friday night event. We all had attractive young ladies at dates, and this older gentleman kept trying to dance with our dates, but he was buying everybody's drinks. And, um, and so we, we, he was fine to join us. And, and it, became a, it, it became apparent to him that I was kind of the leader of the group. And, and uh, Dick asked me, he goes, what are you gonna do when you grow up? And I told him, I'm gonna coach and teach. And he goes, what does a coach make? And I lied to him, I said $12,000. And he goes, a month? And I just, I, I died laughing. I said, nobody makes $12,000 a month. And he gave me his business card and said, I do. And, and that, that planted a seed in my mind that I, confidence is, uh, I've never had a problem with being confident. And, and I kind of said, if, if that guy can do that, I bet I can do it too. And that started my search into uh, trying to figure out, you know, what, what do people do in that business? Mm -hmm. So what were your beginnings like in that industry? Well, I went and interviewed with, uh, with Mr. Cruz uh, that was the sales manager at a firm, T.J. Rainey. T.J. Rainey uh, was uh, not of the, of the uh, aura of Stevens, Inc., which, I mean, Stevens, Inc. is the, one of the premier firms in the world when it comes to, one, their balance sheet, uh, two, their integrity, you know, how they conduct business, uh, their reputation, and to have them as a corporate citizen you know, right here in Little Rock and in Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas is very fortunate to have a corporate citizen of that stature, uh, you know, here in Arkansas. Uh, but T.J. Rainey and Sons was very well respected, and they would have, they would have been considered at that time uh, a firm not on that scale, but in terms of their integrity and how they did business and their business savvy, they would be right there. And Adrian Cruz was the sales manager at Rainey. So I went and interviewed with, with Adrian. He noticed I'd never had a business class. I was an English and math major, never had a business class. But what, what Adrian said, he goes, Rush, you've always functioned in the, in the top one or two percent of everything you've ever done. And if you can function in the top one or two percent of this business, you'll, you'll do very well. 
and, uh, and then Mr. Cruz convinced me uh, to, um, to, to take a position, uh, which I did. I went home, told my parents I was going to take that job. I showed Kim earlier a picture of a note. You may have seen the note. I don't know before uh, when, when you've been in our office. But I asked my dad if I could borrow $350 and move to Little Rock with. My dad turned me down. My dad wasn't being mean. My dad just said, son, I don't have $350 on me. So if I got it, I've got to go to the bank to get it. So you might as well learn to do that yourself. Uh, so I went to the bank and borrowed $350. And that was May the 5th, 1976. And I moved to Little Rock. And that was my stake in life. That's, that's what I started with. So how was your first job then? Uh, well, that was I was a security salesman. They assigned my territory. They asked me, do you want to call Alabama or West Virginia? I didn't know anybody from Alabama. I knew one person from West Virginia. It was a guy named Jeff Bruckner uh, that was in my company at West Point. So I said, give me West Virginia. And um, it, it's, it's a very tough business because, I mean, I mean everyone in West Virginia, uh, they don't wake up every morning just wanting a young guy from Arkansas calling them, trying to sell them something. They all have relationships with established broker dealers, uh, you know, Pittsburgh or from Charlotte, North Carolina or New York City, wherever they're covered. Uh, and and but didn't do any business for four months, and almost thought about taking and you know going back. And that was in May. I knew up until September, I always had a coaching job as a backstop and uh, almost took a job. And uh, a, 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 again, uh, a woman influenced that decision. I was, I was uh, dating a woman who was also an employee of the firm and uh, I was offered a job coaching in Far City and I actually went and interviewed for the job. The pay was actually gonna be $12,000 a year, a thousand a month, which I thought was monumental. And I told her, we're going to move to Far City. We're going to change the lives of these young people and impact them in a meaningful way. And she told me, you can move to Far City, but I'm not moving to Far City. So I, I stayed, uh, stayed in Little Rock. And when I no longer had that crutch of uh, knowing I had something I could fall back to, uh, I was uh, that discipline, that perseverance, that tenacity that, that I had learned so well at the military academy uh, came to, to bear, and, and I was able to, to carve out a meaningful business. And our firm still to this day, 41 years later, uh, we, we do more uh, fixed income municipal bond business in West Virginia than any, anybody else in the country, 41 years later. So do you ever look back and wish that you had become a growth teacher? Well, uh, I mean, I, I, coach, I coach a lot every day at my office, don't I? And I coach a little bit like my daddy. I grab a face mask every once in a while, don't I? Yeah, and I'll shake it pretty good. But uh, and uh, both of my sons, uh, both of my sons were were, at, were Division One athletes, and so I coached them in AAU basketball from the time they were five years old. And about when they, once they get hair on their legs, I quit coaching them because they they think they're smarter than their dad. Uh, so I, I've been able to get that uh, desire to coach and teach uh, from uh, the way I coach and teach at the office. And then I also got to do it in a meaningful way uh, with my two sons as they uh, played AAU basketball and, uh, and still, enjoy, still enjoy that quite a bit. So on the topic of leadership, can you talk a little bit about how you sort of were in leadership roles your entire life? and what those were, and then how you have learned from that now. Well, and I, I, that's, it, it's, I mean, are, are, are leaders born or are leaders made? You know, I don't know. I, I think that those, those intangible qualities that, that enable someone to lead, I, I kind of think you've got them. You know, they, you can get better at it. I know, I, I know I'm a lot better leader today uh, than I was 20 years ago. I think, I think you become a better leader by failure. I, I don't think if you fail, if you don't fail every once in a while at things, you're probably not being aggressive enough or, or taking enough risk. Um, mo most of my failures ha have been relationship-wise. 
but I think as you learn from those mistakes and as you learn to say I'm sorry and as you learn to say I'll do better and as you, you learn to lead by example and never ask anything of your people that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't do yourself, um, uh, I, I, I think you know, people will embrace your leadership and, and re reward you with loyalty and hard work and, uh, uh, and dedication. Can you talk a little bit about the work culture that you've created? Um, well, it's, uh, at, we're, when, when you talk to people in our industry and um, uh, at our place we work, I mean, um, I, w I was raised by parents who were demanding and who, who expected a certain level of performance. So, I mean, uh, I had a, I, I'd never missed a day of school grades one through 12. I had a eight, Methodist, I, I grew up, we have a Methodist preacher here, right here. I uh, grew up in the Methodist church uh, and for perfect attendance back then, y'all probably don't do it anymore, but you get a little medal, you know. And boy, I like, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know if I like the spiritual uh, nurturing as much as I like getting that little medal <laughs> every year, but I love getting that little medal and they'd hang down your coat jacket, you know, just you'd knock them onto each other. And, um, and then I have not missed, if, if you Googled me and read some stuff on me, I'm known in Little Rock business circles as being a little crazy. I had missed a day of work in 41 years for being sick. And uh, I've, I've never missed two consecutive work days uh, for vacation, for, and, I, and, and the guys at our office, um, I, 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 I try to set the standard for them for what I expect, and, and that's a little too rigorous. But uh, I've got one employee, got one employee that hadn't missed a day of work for being sick in nine years now. And uh, I, I do insist that he take a week off, spend time with his family. But my oldest son works at Cruz with me and uh, sits right by me at work. And I'm, I'm proud that he's embraced my example and he hadn't missed a day of work in uh, nine years for illness or whatever. We just, we work through it and come to work and get it done. So I also want to ask you about this. So, and you also, but you, that was at a young age too, because you didn't miss any Sunday school for like 19 years or something and all these different. So what, what do you think that is in you, that determination? I mean, is that, can that be taught or is that just in it? Well, I, I mean, I, I didn't, uh, um, you know, my, well, I mean, I, I was, I mean, well, from the time I knew what a valedictorian was, I knew I was expected to be that. And from the time, if I was going to be a scout, well, I knew I was expected to be an Eagle Scout. And, and that was ingrained in me uh, from a young age. And, I, that doesn't, and so my dad was hard on me, but, I mean, I, I, I was probably a little bit scared of my dad. Um, I never really, you know, I never really, I, I never really whipped my boys. I, my wife would tell me to, to give them a spank and I'd take them in the closet and I'd get my belt and I'd hit my leg and I would tell them, y'all cry a little bit, do something. And they'd go, oh, daddy, oh. And I'd hit my leg with the belt. And, uh, but I think my boys were scared enough of me growing up that they didn't want to find out what the consequences were if, if they bucked their dad or, or, or didn't take his stern advice. So parenting's a tough deal. I mean, kids don't come with a handbook. But I wanted to please my mom and my dad so bad as a young person. And then, and, and I know you can't look at me now and realize it, but I'm still a bit of an athlete. I, <laughs> and and I, wanted, I wanted to, I, I mean, I mean, to me, I wanted to compete in the classroom. Um, I, I don't want to sound pompous, but in 41, I mean, I got to run the place. I've got to, I've got to handle personnel manners. I have, to, I have to do things that take me off the sales floor, but I'm still the top producer at the firm. 
and, and my competitive fervor, I, I won't let. I won't let another one of those salesmen down there beat me in a production month. No one has ever beaten me a single month in production at Cruz and Associates ever. And, um, um, and, if, and, and, and again, I'll be proud of when somebody does do it, but it happened, hadn't happened yet and it's not gonna happen for a while. <laughs> but, but I don't know, I mean, and like my sister, my sister was a good student, my sister was a good young girl, but I mean, she didn't respond to that kind of parenting the same way I did. Kids are all different. Uh, my kids, I, I had, I had my, my daughter, I mean, my daughter would, would laugh and just kind of tell me to, to, you know, take a hike. And, and, my son, and again, it's just, I mean, she's, my daughter's strong and uh, very, uh, very uh, resolute in her ways. But it's, it's hard to know what makes one kid respond to that type of encouragement and another one not. But I, uh, my parents were so good to me that uh, I wanted to please them in everything I did. So do you think that competitive spirit is a trait that you look for in employees? Um, I don't know. We, we, um, we hire people. You have to watch. I mean, you, we have so many, so many people want to get into our business because your upside is so great. Um, it's probably the greatest business on earth where if you don't have to have a, any of your own capital and you can come in at 8 and you can leave at 4.30 and, and you can accumulate, uh, if, if you're good at it and work hard at it, the, the way you can accumulate wealth as quickly as you can. So people will get into our business, I, I mean, almost work for free because it's all commission-driven. Um, uh, it, it's, um, it, it's a unique business and um, uh, I've, I've just been fortunate to be in it and, and, and be able to, to, to have customers that want to do business with you and help you be successful. Talk a little bit about hard work. I mean, is that something that you attribute a lot of your success to? Um, that, that if <clears throat> I'm, I, yeah, but I mean, uh, it, it's, um, if I had to identify, you know, the one attribute that I think helps you be successful, or, or, or the, the hard work would be it. Now, I mean, it helps to be smart as well. And when I can, I, I try to tell young people that, that come to work for us that if you could only do one thing, I would rather have that hard worker that has an insatiable desire to succeed. If, if I can get him with just a little, or get him or her with just a little bit of brains as well, that certainly doesn't hurt, you know. But I'll I'll take a I'll take a worker over a you know a, a real smart person any day. The real smart folks want to analyze everything and and try to figure it out. You know, it's in. Um, Sometimes you can overanalyze things in our business. Well, as a leader, how do you motivate people to be hard workers? Well, by example. I mean, I'm, I'm. You used to bring me. I mean, when, what seven in the morning? You'd be delivering inventories, right? And I'd be at my desk, wouldn't I? Yep. So, I mean, be the first one there, the last one to leave. I, I think in our business, always be willing to, to help others. Uh, when you're dealing with a bunch of, of commission salespeople. And our business, if if they think you're trying to put some of their their commissions or their money into your pocket, that that doesn't go over very well. So I I try I I where I when I can help one of our people try to be productive and and be successful and open a new account or get something done, if you're always eager to help them and help them get that done, uh, I I think they they like that in terms of knowing that, that the, the person that's supposed to be leading them is always ready and willing to help them. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about your family? Because clearly you're dedicated to work. How do you balance that with your family values? Well, um, I'm probably not as... I mean, I've never missed a dance recital. I've never missed a, uh, a play. My daughter was kind of in the, the arts and everything. I never missed a ball game. 
uh, coached every game they've ever played in pretty much. But so I, I didn't miss much, but we didn't vacation very much. So um, I, I, I probably was a better father, better father than I was a husband. I'm real l lucky that my wife is uh, forgiving and uh, understanding and patient, uh, mostly forgiving, I think. So, I mean, if I had anything to do over, I would try to be, I would try to be a better husband, try to be a better father. So what's your advice for hardworking young people to have a balance in their life? Mm. Mm. Well, I would, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's difficult. Well, I mean, and, and, and young professionals are, I mean, it, once you get end up getting married, but I mean, uh, marriage, marriage is a, a very uh, difficult endeavor, and you, um, it's, it's sometimes when I, when I, you know, both my sons are, are married, my daughter uh, is divorced, and I, sometimes when I see young people get upset about something, I, I've, I've had to, I've had to, I mean, you're going to have to, you're going to have to forgive him or her for a lot more than that. So you might ought to, you might ought to get used to it right now. But you, you have to be forgiving. You have to be patient. You, you have to um, – um, um, marriage uh, is, I, I think, uh, uh, something that's sacred. Uh, and it's also something that's uh, holy. And it's not to be entered into lightly. It's a huge responsibility. And especially when little ones come along, uh, it's it's time to it's time to be an adult, put childish things away, and be responsible. There's no bigger responsibility on the planet than being responsible for for raising young people. Can you talk a little bit about UCA and your involvement with UCA? Um. Well, uh, UCA, I had a great experience here. Graduated, um, have stayed involved. Uh, the best friends I have right now as an adult were made here at UCA. Um, you know, my best friend, uh, he and I were fraternity brothers here at UCA. You know, he lives here in Conway now. Um, uh, I've, I served on the foundation board for several years. Served, uh, uh, spanned four decades. Four decades three terms on the Board of Trustees of the university here. I've uh, been burned in effigy across the street over here. We, I, I went through how many college presidents? It was a bunch. They were uh, tumultuous times during my tenure on the board. I mean, uh, we had great leadership here, but uh, we, we've also faced some challenges um, uh, as um, um, many of you here on the faculty may remember and know. But there again, that's that it, it uh, going through some of those things makes you stronger, uh, makes the, 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 the school a better place, and you can learn a lot about leadership having gone through some of that as well. What about what does Conway mean to you, and how, how do you think you've impacted Conway? Uh, well, a lot of people think I live in Conway. I think you even asked me, What do you live in Conway? Uh, my best friend is a guy named Hal Crafton, he and I live together. Uh, for three years when I was in college. You know, Hal called me um, in 19, uh, 1989 and uh, this old farm out on Hogan Road, well, it's where your church is now. Um, and um, that, that used to be called Hogan Farm, and it was a, it was a dirt road uh, in 1989. That's what, 28 years ago. And um, Hal and I... Uh, Hal said, I, I think I could figure out how to develop real estate. He has that ability to drive out and look at a vacant piece of land and have the vision to what you could do with it. And we each put up $12,500. That's what we started our real estate company with. So when you're riding around in West Conway and you, and you see signs that say Rush Hal Properties, well, I'm the Rush, you know, he's the Hal. But I, I don't know how many lots we've developed in single family. I, would, I don't know. I bet it's over 10,000, um, you know, several thousand apartment units. And, and Hal, Hal has done all that. And so, um, and I, I've just, um, in the early years, I probably 
uh, provided uh, some, some, maybe a bank thought I might have added a little financial stability, but Hal doesn't need me now, but because, you know, his loyalty to me, his friendship to me, his steadfastness, uh, I've been fortunate that Hal's let me continue to be a partner with him as he's, he's been one of the driving forces to kind of reshape uh, Faulkner County and, and West Conway. Well, I, I, one, I, I think you have to have that vision and you have to believe in it. And, and you have to be able to, to articulate that vision to someone that would believe in you. I mean, when I got that $350 loan from Perry Lee at the merge, he didn't want to loan it to me. Uh, but, you know, Perry knew me. He had played football for my dad. And, and I, I mean, literally that was really just $350. But if Perry Lee hadn't given that to me, I'd have probably had to t take in that coaching job. Um, there's a young lady sitting over your left shoulder. Anna, where's Anna? Not left. She's in the back. Yeah. But the first time I met her, Anna came in my office with this passionate, fervent um, vision of a business she could build over in, is it East Africa? Yeah. You're right. And, you know, she was so passionate about the dream she had. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's like my checkbook just jumped out of the drawer. I hope that when you tell people, I hope you say, nobody's ever written a check for me as quick as Mr. Harding did. Yeah, I know. And so, um, I mean, again, it's, I know everyone thinks it takes, a, I hear so many times, well, it takes money to make money. And I don't buy that. It doesn't. Um, uh, it, it, it takes a dream, and then you've got to find someone that, that believes in your dream. But for someone to believe in it, you've got to be passionate about it. You've got to be informed. You've got to be willing to work. I love to watch my favorite TV show. I love to watch Shark Tank. I love it. And I can almost get emotional when I see those people come in there and articulate their dreams to people that can make it happen for them, you know. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, it, if you told people that Hal Crafton and I started the real estate business we've got here in Conway on $12,500, and neither one of us put in another penny, but we had people believe in us. You know, where Royal Oaks is now and Crooked Creek, those two subdivisions were, that was the Crafton's old home place. And uh, Hal had some cousins whose mother had died and they, they wanted you know, some liquidity on. So Mr. Crafton decided to sell that farm and, and, and Hal called me and, uh, and, and he said, I, th I think we can develop this. Uh, Mr. Ott's the only person in Conway that'll buy it, but I, th I think dad'll let us buy it. And, and like you said, I mean, we, we were, I mean, I, I, had a, I had a developing balance sheet and had decent income, but probably if I'd have gone in and told a banker, we're going to become real estate developers, we've never done it before, loan us the money to buy this farm. And that, that was back in the late 80s, and it was several million dollars. Well, Hal had an aunt named Aunt Babe, uh, and... And Aunt Babe was partners with uh, uh, Mr. Crafton and all that. And then uh, Aunt, Aunt Babe ended up, and Mr. Crafton, they ended up, instead of us going to the bank and having to borrow several million dollars to make that happen, they, they you know, carried the paper on that. And as we sold lots, we would pay them off as we sold lots in those first subdivisions. And, and they had said, well, all we're going to do, if you go to the bank and borrow the money, we're just going to buy a CD from the bank. So if the bank was paying 3% on CDs, 
as long as we paid them 3% interest, they were fine with that, and we didn't have to go down and borrow a couple of million dollars and pay 6 or 7% interest. So, but I, I think they knew, they knew how, they knew me, they believed in us, and, um, and, but you, you have to have people believe in you along the way. And, and, and the way you get people to believe in you and what you're trying to do in a business is you've got to be passionate about it, you've got to be informed about it, and you've got to be able to work your tail off. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, I used, so uh, my first job was in sales, and uh, when I first started in Make a Sale for the first two weeks, I was two days away from being fired, and uh, you know, I became the youngest promoted sales manager though, uh, out of it. Do you remember you said uh, you know, four months without a sale? Do you remember that first close? Oh, yeah, I remember. I, I sold a guy named Ed Marn in New Martinsville, West Virginia. I'll never forget it. And uh, it was like manna from heaven. It was like a, a, like a gentle rain on a scorching day. It was, uh, uh, but, and what I'd done is, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I told Kim earlier, I thought amortization was a book in the Old Testament. I didn't have a clue. I'd never had a business class. And so once that, once that I had that crutch of coaching behind me, then I went on the road and went and called. And my, my standard, and West Virginia was a great place to call. It was a lot like Arkansas in that it's a rural state. Uh, they didn't have any branch banking back then. West Virginia and Arkansas were the last two states in the union to do away with their usury law. So if you had 252 banks in rural West Virginia, you had 252 chances to do business. And, and I just went and sat down with those people. I would go on the road for, you know, a week and a half, two weeks at a time, knock on doors, and I would tell them I worked for a good company. I was raised by a good family. Uh, I'm a hard worker. And if you'll give me the privilege of competing for your business, I'll never disappoint you. And I would tell them when, you, when your other broker's at the yacht club or he's at the golf course on Friday afternoon at 3.30 and you need something, I'm going to be at my office. And if you say that often enough with enough, with, with, with enough confidence, and they, it, if you say it and mean it, it's got a ring of truth to it. And West Virginia was a great place. For, you know, you think, well, I mean, there's, no, really, there's, there's some big money in West Virginia that wealth didn't spread out because it's, you know, it's, but there's, there's some big money there. But it was a great state for me to call because they were, Self-made people, you know, you know, a lot of them came from the same type of background I did. And, uh, and I, a lot of them wanted to see if you could back up what you'd say with performance. And, uh, and after I went on those road trips and made those connections, well, then I started to do business. And, um, and, and we started to get it done. But congratulations on your ascent to a sales manager. That's cool. Yes, sir. What's the toughest business lesson you ever learned? That's a good one. Um, um, I would say, I would say um, the futility of hubris. Um, when I was when I was young and once I got good, man, I, I was, boy, I was, I was cocky. I was bad cocky. And, um, uh, and um, I, I probably had some relationships uh, that floundered, that should have flourished, that I still struggle with to this day because I... I, I let my hubris and my false pride uh, taint what should have been a real meaningful relationship long term in a, in a couple of situations. And, and so I think uh, uh, successful people uh, need to be humble people. And I don't think you measure a person by what they've acquired and accumulated. I think a better measuring stick is, is what they do for others. And it, I had to learn that the hard way, uh, and, and, and 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 had some people I care about help me learn it. Yes, sir. Um, I graduated from UCA uh, with the intention of teaching, and um, after finishing 
looking at and starting to go towards job applications, I've realized that I want to do completely other things, um, more like business focus. What do you recommend to people who have gone really far in one direction and then want to change gears and start making money in a completely other direction? Well, I, and I've got a nephew that's struggling with getting employed right now, and I know everybody does that. I mean, I, I tell my nephew, put a little starch in your shirt, you no know, shave, you know, smile, start knocking on doors. I mean, I mean, find some real companies, knock on those doors, ask for an opportunity to, to you know, to work, and then you follow through by you're the first person there every day and the last one to leave. And if you work and give great effort, people are going to notice you. But um, it, it's it's difficult. But I think you've got to decide this is what I want to do. Be committed to it, and uh, but young people look at me like I'm crazy. When, no, you don't. You don't get a job like that, Mr. Harding. You get online and you fill out an application and stuff. But I would. I mean, I. It, I mean, my top. I, I'll tell you this story about a young man that lives here in Conway. He's a UCA business graduate. His name's Michael Lambert. Okay, grew up in a small town. I get a, you remember Lambert, don't you? Right, built about like you are, a little guy, uh, smart. But I get a call one day. Hello, Mr. Harding. My name's M Michael Lambert. I'm a UCA graduate. I hear you like UCA graduates. Uh, I, I've got a master's degree. I need a job. I've got a wife. Um, but you, I, I said, nah, we're not hiring right now. 30 days later, I'd get another call. Oh, Mr. Harding, this is Michael Lambert. So I told him to come in for an interview, okay? I, I tell my, my, I mean, so maybe he can be an analyst. I said, but in our business, you have salespeople. Then you have, you have people that aren't, I mean, those salespeople are up on the big floor. They're calling people, selling every day. Then we have what we call bankers. Those are the guys coming to the CFO at UCA. If you're going to build a new library, hire us to sell the bonds to build that library, okay? Then you have analysts that if UCA hires us, that analyst is going to be breaking down the balance sheets, uh, putting the prospectus together to go solicit those orders. So, well, maybe this Lambert fella can do that. So I, I told my, I told the, the head of that department, I said, pay him 1500 a month, he can't live on that, and he'll quit, okay? So the guy, he just said, I, he told me, I'll, you know, I'll work for free. I just need a job to prove myself. And I'm not in, there's no hyperbole in the story, it's true. I said, pay him 1500 a month, he can't live on that, and he'll quit, okay? It's about four months later, somebody goes, where'd you find this Lambert guy? I go, what do you mean? They go, he can do anything on a computer. He's so smart. We've got him working on Louisiana deals, and the FA down there won't do a deal unless Michael Lambert can be the analyst. I called him there. I said, give me a raise up to 3000 a month, okay? <laughs> All right. Then, as his stature grew at the firm, he, he decided, and he was the head analyst of the firm making, I mean, it's probably not appropriate to talk about it, but he was making you know, well into six figures as being the head analyst at our firm. Uh, and you would think he would be comfortable with that. He's decided, I want to be a banker now. I want to, instead of me being the analyst that works on the deals, I want to go find the deals, be the banker responsible for those deals, putting them together and getting them done. Uh, and, and some of us question that. Well, Michael, I mean, man, you're doing so good doing what you're doing. Sure want to do that? Yep, okay. Uh, I mean, he's and 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 he's paid on commissions, not salaries. So the more business he does, the more money he makes, and and it's the, his transformation now in the banking side of it is phenomenal. I mean, he's um, he he, I mean, he he will make deep, deep, deep into six figures. And he earns every penny of it. He's not paid that as a salary. And so he's been with our firm now, I don't know, 13, 14 years. Saved every dollar he's ever made. Um, uh, has one child. But it all started with a phone call of, I know you like UCA people, Mr. Harding. 
I've got a wife and I need a job. And um, he didn't apply, you know, online. Yes, sir. Are you being right no, no, I'm fine. I'm here. I'd, right. I'd rather, I don't like all that. Okay. Yes, we have, like, time for two more questions. Yes, sir. Through all your years and the experiences that you've been through and the successes that you've had, how often has the old saying, show me your friends, I'll show you your future, right through sure you? Well, um, I couldn't, um, I, I couldn't have done, well, I mean, again, uh, help start an investment banking firm in Little Rock. We started our company, seven of us. Three of us were dead. One of us got out alive. He's just retired. The other three of us still go to work together every day. Okay? Right. Um, you know, capitalized our firm on a meager amount. Uh, you know, grew it to, to 250 employees. We've been owned by First Security Bank now, uh, which has a banking presence here in Conway. They're headquartered in Cersei. We've been owned by them since 2000. Uh, we couldn't have done what we had, we've done if it hadn't been for the friendships and relationships that we had. I'm, I'm friends, I'm friends, good friends with all my customers. You know? I mean, it's, I mean, if somebody didn't want to do business with you, it's hard to have a business or build one. Uh, here in Conway, if I didn't have friends like, you know, Hal Crafton, uh, Kevin Watson, Richie Arnold, Johnny Adams, Mark Ferguson, I mean, I couldn't have, I couldn't have accomplished anything that we've done without those people. And those, those people are happy for us for the success we've had. And, and it sounds like to me you believe that Friends is a good measurement. I do too. I mean, it's I value my friends, and they're they're worth a lot more than than, than money. I promise you. Yes. Sir. I was just curious about that transition because you said you went to you went to TJR and you started there, and then we know the next chapter with who's an associate. How did you go? What was that transition like? Who started? Who initiated? Well, well, uh, TJ Rainey was a family company. And uh, the guy that ran T.J. Rainey at that time was named Bob Rainey. Bob Rainey uh, had cousins and brothers, and Adrian Cruz wasn't related to the Rainey family, but he was the sales manager of their uh, general market division. They had a guy, a gentleman named Winston Faulkner, that was the head of their Arkansas division. So the, the, the people that worked in Arkansas were kind of separate from the people that called around the country. Bob Rainey Sr. died, and there was a tussle, if you will, within the Rainey family who was going to leave the company after that. Uh, Adrian had backed the wrong Rainey in that deal. Uh, the Rainey that became the leader of the company, he and Adrian, uh, Adrian, uh, Adrian had scoliosis, and, and curvature was fine, and was bent like this. And Adrian never, and he never missed work. And you know, one day I'm up talking to Adrian, and uh, somebody called in and said, "Can't be at work today. I got a backache." And Adrian kind of laughed and said, "Yeah, that's my favorite excuse." <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, so when when that situation happened, I guess they watched too many Western movies. That the new Indian chief, the first thing he does is get rid of everybody that that backed. The, I guess his opponent, the B chief. So I, I'll never forget that day. Adrian walked by, by my desk and said, everything's going to be fine. I'll be in touch. And Adrian had the integrity. He didn't plot his exit. By, by this time, I, this is 1979. I started in 1976. So by this time, my learning, once I got it, my learning curve was pretty steep. So I was the top producer at Rainey at that time. But Adrian didn't come and tell me, well, I'm gonna go start my own firm, I want you to be a part of it. He didn't go to the other young people in the office because while he still was in a position of authority at TJ Rainey, it would have been inappropriate for him to advocate that fiduciary responsibility and start recruiting who he wanted to be with him. But he walked by, he had a cane, he walked by my desk, I, the, the, the sales floor had desk by desk, and Adrian said, don't worry, I'll be in touch. And he had never solicited me until after he had resigned and left and was no longer with the firm. So then myself, Adrian, 
and five other guys from Rainey. Uh, again, I went back to the Merchants and Planners Bank in Clarendon, and this time I wanted to borrow fifty thousand dollars. You know, and 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 then uh, I had enough of a track record, and I had you know I had a meager financial statement, but I had good I had good income. The bank loaned me fifty thousand dollars, and that was my initial stake in Cruz and Associates. And then, um, you know, I mean, we just worked. We, we made a commitment to each other when we started that firm. All we're going to do is work for ten years, and we made nobody took a salary. All we took was our commissions, and we said we're just going to work like crazy. And ten years from now, we're going to look up and see what we built. And no, we were we were real proud of where we were ten years down the road. But we, we really did that. And if you're for those of you mothers, there's, there's an old timer in the back. <laughs> Think about it. We started the business in 1979. What happened to interest rates during Jimmy Carter in 1980? The yield curve inverted. Short term interest rates went to 20 percent. The 30 year treasury was at 14 percent. Okay, so that means we started our pivoted little farm on three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Well, if you had five million dollars worth of inventory and it lost ten percent of its value as interest rates rise, fixed income bonds erode in price. So if your five million inventory <coughs> lost just ten percent of its value, that's half a million dollars. We only had three hundred twenty thousand. Uh, I told Jeff, uh, I told Kim earlier, if we had had the same rules and regulations then that we have now, we've gone busted. Because now they make you mark your inventory to market every day, trying to avoid a financial crisis like we had in 2008. But we didn't have those rules back in the early 80s. But if we would have been forced to go sell our inventory, we'd have been broke. You know? And so all we did was put our head down. And then about 1984, interest rates started to turn and they started to come down. And really, if, if you look at if you look at you look at the markets from 1983, 84 to present, I mean, I, I don't think I'm that smart. I do think I work hard. I think, dang, I'm lucky because if you look at from 1984 till now, interest rates have just done this. Okay, we've been in a, a bull market for fixed income products, so I think I'm lucky. And then if you look, wait a minute, Russ, when did you say you got into real estate investments in Conway? I go 1989. Well, could you pick a better community in the United States than Conway that you got into the real estate business in 1989 and you looked at the growth and the, the exponential development that's taking place in Conway? So I don't think I'm that smart. I'm just damn lucky. <laughs> but luck doesn't hurt. Perfect. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Sorry, we're being kind of blinded up here by the sun, but standing works. Um, if you could leave us with one piece of business advice, what would it be? Uh, I'll read it to you. And I didn't plan this. Okay. But I like you folks. And I don't mean to be corny. <laughs> Father's Day was when? When was that? Well, I'm going to read you what I got. One of my Father's Day presents. And this can... This can tell you the most important part of business advice. You have taught me how to be a loving husband and father, to be kind and generous to everyone, no matter who they are, to face adversity head on and never back down, to always do the right thing, no matter what the cost. Am I not the luckiest father on the planet Earth to get that for my son? And that would be the best advice I could give you in business. Okay? Thank you all. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rush. Thank you. 
All right, thank you guys for coming. If you have any questions about the conductor, let us know. This space is our maker space. It opens August 31st from 1 to 3 p.m. Our master maker is Jason in the back, and he can tell you all about the 3D printers, uh, the laser cutter, the CNC machine, anything else you have a question about. Thank you guys for coming.